Well, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. This webinar is hosted by Southeast University and uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. First, I will spend three or four minutes introducing Professor Hovestadt, both in English and in Chinese. Uh, Lutko Hovestadt is a professor of architecture of ETH since 2000. He is the director of the Computer Aided Architectural Design Lab and the co founders of several companies. He is also my supervisor when I did my PhD program in ETH. His background is both architecture and computer science. He worked as a scientific researcher with Professor Fritz Haller at the Technical University Karlsruhe when he received his doctoral degree. Now his interests are design tools and management of complex systems, emphasizing generative design, digital production, and building intelligence. Mahovishta教授是瑞士苏黎世联邦理工学院建筑师教授。也是CAAD实验室主任 向社会转化。那么现在他的主要研究方向是机器智能跟建筑理论。那么这次Hovestad教授帮助我们组织了这次线上的数字技术论坛。那么昨天是第一次活动,昨天呢是一次预热。那么从今天开始呢,都有,都
if machines can do that, what we call architecture, something there's something which is uh, missing, and we need uh, another or in, in another perspective uh, to uh, to, um, uh, to our research. So what is very important, and you will see that in my, my talk, is I make a clear distinction, which is not, uh, uh, you can't do that in, in English language. In German language, it's, it's quite uh, simple and obvious. I make a distinction between architecture and design. I would say design is not architecture, exactly not. And uh, with design, and uh, uh, this is uh, with the machines today. So. This is the principal question. So I give you some uh, background information about the motivation, what I'm, uh, how I'm, I'm uh, how I'm talking and what I'm talking about. Uh, it will be a very Western style talk because I think it, it's important. Uh, so I, I don't know how to understand how to uh, how to deal with uh, the Chinese. Uh, environment with the way uh, you are thinking about architecture. And I think it's very important that I make it very clear how I am thinking so then you can uh, uh, make your story out of it. So in 2000, we started at, at, with the first uh, phase in our research. We have a group of 16 PhDs all the time for, for 20 years now. So it's a huge group in this field and uncomparable uh, huge in this field of research in architecture and computing. The first eight years we had been scouts. We founded several companies. We collaborated with big uh, offices. And uh, this was, and we succeeded in fully automated design. So then we made a step back we uh, went towards theory, philosophy, and mathematics, and we wrote a, a couple of books, and we're still continuing with writing that, about what is the underlying uh, thinking, body of thinking of what we are facing today uh, in our technological environment, economic, political, technological environment. So this found a certain uh, saturation around 2017. And now we shift towards building a school on there to re-articulate what architecture might be about in the realm of the digital. So I would say it's a kind of a digital renaissance we are facing and it's in symmetry and we'll talk about that in symmetry to the uh, Western European 15th, uh, 16th uh, century. So we can learn a lot, especially from these centuries, how to behave today. So this is a very reference of architecture. And it, Renaissance means it's a rebirth of, uh, of, of, uh, of human thinking. And it's a re-articulation of architecture. It always comes with that in our culture. So this is a very reference. It's with Alberti, Palladio, and so on, especially in Italy. <clears throat> So my personal fascination, my background is, is this. I am a student of Fritz Haller. It's very minimalistic, very functionalistic uh, architecture. I like Archizum, Fuller, Stockhausen, Foucault, and so on. So this is my personal, these are my masters. So. The situation so I experienced in the last uh, 25 years in research is that I would say that the key challenge in architecture with computing is invisible. So it's about logistics. It's about, so if architecture is how to join things in space, the way of jointing things of digital things is different than jointing mechanical things. So and this is very, very abstract. So and what we, what all the research which comes, uh, which comes prominent, makes this invisible new setup we are building our, our buildings with visible. 
So therefore, it's it's these, these stories about sustainable, about the robots, about production, about uh, new materials, and so on. It's always a dream of the lost world, of the lost mechanical or thermodynamical world of the of the centuries of 15 to 19. So and that's a little sad because it it hides us. It it's, it makes an obstacle towards uh, to under, an understanding of what computing really is, what it is about, and where the challenges are. So you can't see what computers are about. That's very important. So there's no way to do that. That's the first thing. So we are a little corrupted by the visibility of our research. So I don't trust images. The next is, I entered the research around 1985, and especially in our uh, field, it's something like that, that the research with these small groups we have in our field, quite different from these huge AI groups at Google today, or uh, at the big architect, uh, uh, CAT firms and so on, uh, like uh, Autodesk. They have huge apparatus of researchers. And at university, it's very small, very few people. And they are isolated at the different universities and so on. So, it's, it's a, so that's a, a big disbalance. So when I experienced the research, and I was very frustrated with that in the beginning that the research mainly was that the companies, the software made a new release and then the researcher somehow showed what you can do with this release. So therefore the, the principle of research, the principal questions had been hidden with the companies. And it gets more, more uh, evident uh, uh, since then. So it started around 85. Before that, the principles had been explicit, had been on the, uh, on, on the conferences and so on. And around the mid of 1980s, these things got to the companies. So the principal research got to the companies and uh, the research we call research things then, it's a kind of applications of the new releases of prominent software. So that was very frustrating for me, uh, who wants to go on principal research at university. So we experienced the same thing, and therefore I think it's it's constituent for for our our global global culture. We made research on synthesizing food, and so this is a new domain. We uh, entered this domain with uh, with AI techniques. So because with AI techniques, always and in all domains the same. So we get very brave and went to different domains. And for example, to food and the synthesis uh, of uh, of food, a kind of uh, new uh, uh, farming because this is a, a big topic uh, start in, in architecture and urban design and so on. We started there going to the principal and it was quite symmetric to what we experienced in, uh, in, in CAT in architecture until 1985 around. It was very clear what was the research in food in agriculture and so on. And from then on, you, it was simply hidden. It was always with the companies. And the only thing what you could find out what happened is looking at the products sold. So therefore, I think around mid of the 1980s, research somehow switched from universities to companies. And universities are more applications towards the productivity of, uh, of, of companies. So the next interesting thing is just that the, the theory, the same time around uh, um, uh, 19, in the 80s, 90s, the, um, the budget in US and UK for humanities was cut by 80% which means all the researchers got precarious. So they, they, they could not make career anymore because there was no money. 
which means there was a boost of different uh, theories. These theories are very short. And there's always, so uh, it's always about getting a kind of prominency, adapting it to the mainstream. And therefore, for example, we have digital humanities and it's burning super fast, but it's not sustainable because these people try to do and they can't succeed because there's no money. So we have that with object-oriented ontologies, these crazy things. You have that with digital humanities and so on. In my perception, this is a, this, this is a new understanding. It's, 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 it's a turn of what theory is. Theory gets more towards marketing in a, in a market in the, in, since the 80s. So it's, for my understanding, it's very important uh, to what's... Uh, theory is. So therefore, for example, in our field, we have a, a very, a very substantial misunderstanding of what computing is about. So with our theoretical uh, reading now of for 10 years now, we clearly understand that the principle of mathematics, the principle of thinking of what computing is about, was articulated in 1880. It was not post-war after 45, and it's definitely not uh, after 2000. So it is 1880, interestingly. And for example, if we have this uh, algorithm of Google uh, and they got a patent uh, in 1998 for this algorithm, this is Markov. And this was a Russian mathematician, and it was 19, if I'm not wrong, 1904 or something like that. So it's about 100 years earlier. It was in this time and not this time. But they, they got a patent for that, but the thinking, the mathematical thinking for that was established there. That's very interesting and very important to, to understand. So for example, our reference, in, in grammars in architecture is uh, Steiny, this paper here, how to make subdivisions and so on. So look at the references here. You see Pavlovsky, 55, the earliest, 41, Eichert and so on. And it's a paper from 71. So these are the references. I started my research in shape grammars, which means it's uh, the, the very key references was this paper of Steiny, how to make uh, uh, shape grammars on architectural uh, design. So we didn't succeed because this is a geometrical understanding of this. So just to make fancy forms. And that we didn't succeed in, in, in organizing our architectural questions for that because in architecture, it's not clear what space is. So with Steiny and this grammar, it's, it, there's an absolute space and space itself is not to discussion. In architecture, it's not like that. So you have, for example, the construction, you have the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 air condition, you have uh, the functional needs, you have the technical solutions and, 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 and so on. So you have the spatial uh, behavior and the spatial organization and, and these kind of things. And all these notions of space, they compete. And architecture is about finding uh, a constitution and, and a balance between all these different notions of space and make that work and stable. So this is not the range of, uh, of this grammar. And therefore we didn't succeed to make architecture with it. It took me 20 years to find this reference here with Hilbert. And you see, it's the same thing, but with Hilbert, and this is 1891. It's the same thing, but this is topological. And this is about constitution, and negotiation about speciality. That is exactly what we need to make architecture. And with that, we succeeded. 
So the interesting thing is that I grew up with this reference that's not referenced to the very simil similar thing. So it looks the same, it's exactly the same, but it's making this primitive without reference and taking me the opportunity to, to solve my architectural intention. And this older one directly uh, uh, gave me uh, the hint of how this is doing. And now you go to Mitchell, for example. This is the very famous 78 about uh, the same thing about uh, uh, Palladio, making these rules. So and I would say this is simply not Palladio, but Durand, which is uh, uh, just uh, 200 years later. So it's a Durand-like reading of Palladio. And if you go for Palladio, but this will take more. So therefore, you get a conceptual, a principal conceptual mismatch on how to read uh, architecture just because of this shortcut from uh, uh, topology to uh, geometry. So it's a little complicated to see but, uh, and to read, but uh, I think it's important to see these dates, to see these symmetries, and uh, try to understand. Uh, so this is a kind of skeleton how to organize things about uh, computing. So this is my background. Now I want to tell you what I think about what computing is. And what, if it is not visible, what is it? And this is a famous citation of Norbert Wiener. Information is neither matter nor energy. So what is it then? So matter means uh, you, uh, you can uh, grasp it, you can, you can and catch it. Energy is how it is driven. What is it then? So, so. And I would say computing, these are aliens from outer space. And to show you what, what I think what computers is. So this is this famous when I grew up, this was 69, I was nine years old. This was the time when my parents bought a TV set. And uh, then we sat there and looked the man on the moon. <clears throat> so, and I think this is computing, these are computing, and this is information technology, and they are aliens, and they show up somehow in, in all the different forms we experience in the 20th century. So, and I think they are the TV, the automobile, the nuclear energy, the airplane, the bubble gum, the antibiotics, the synthetic fertilizer, the laser light, the bikini, the photovoltaic, electronic computer, Xerox window systems, mobile phones, and so on. So this is a list of Wikipedia of the 20th most prominent inventions of the 20th century. So I think this is information and information, information technology and information technology. These are aliens and they can take any form, any shape, and they just landed and we are super confused. We don't know what to do with them. So now let's look how they appeared. Look, for example, at this movie in 2000, in the mood for love, for example, or uh, Brokovich. They're taking a, a, a court telephone, and they're always talking in this movie, and they don't have mobile phones. When I started at ETH in 2000, there was no mobile phone. So when you see, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's getting, it's, it's very fast. So we have uh, two principal uh, attitudes towards that. And we can see that towards this alienated uh, environment. We can see it uh, here. So either afraid and the machines are athletic. So when we have, for example, Blade Runner, Terminator, Edge of Tomorrow, Godzilla, and so on. So they are super athletic and strong, and we are afraid of them and we are fighting them, these are the aliens, or they come 
in a kind of coexistence, for example, uh, transcendence, Lucy or her. So then we have that, so the alien is just in his ear and stalking all time uh, as a girlfriend. So these are the principal two uh, attitudes. If we look at the history of computing and uh, AI, we have three different phases. We call the, it's called the golden years from 56 to 74. And uh, we see these kind of interfaces, these kind of role play and how to use it, environment. These are the aliens existentialistic in our, so we call that existentialistic, we have Sartre uh, and, and, and so on. These are, and we look at the movies with, for that, and this is the architecture, Venturi, alienating. Then there was a winter, the first winter. This is my, the time when I uh, started uh, my PhD. We had uh, the window system, these are the users. These are the aliens. And this is the architecture of the aliens. So now they are super friendly and childish and, and, and so on. And they try to understand, they want to go home and everything. So very consistent. And these are the computer interfaces of these aliens. And this is what we face today. We have this environmental green uh, urban uh, setting. Everything is with computers. These are the interfaces. These are the aliens. And I would say these are prominent examples of architecture of that. So they are super empowered in a medialized uh, sense. So if we look how we behave towards machines, so this is our principal attitude towards this machine. We'd seen it's super fast in developing. So they're uh, accelerating everything. In China, it's even much faster. So we'd seen that we can be afraid or friend. We'd seen the different phases of, uh, of development. In our culture, there are three different strategies how to articulate, how to, uh, how to make artifacts in this kind of environment. So we have a satirical setup. So this is, if we go with Wiener, we had it here. No information. It's neither matter nor energy. So now if we go, if information plays matter. So if you make a shortcut between information and matter, this is satire in our traditional setup in Western culture. This is seduction. And if you go to food, it looks like this. So it's super a prosperous, strong there and stupid. So if we play, uh, if information plays information, so if it's neither matter nor energy, this is an interesting setup. Information plays information. This then I would say is not seduction, it's challenge. And we have this kind of molecular kitchen. So things you never seen, you never ate before because it's synthetic. So it's playing super artificial and, um, and sophisticated. This is what I think it's, it's interesting with information that you, you get friend with the aliens. And we have the third uh, attitude toward that information plays energy. Information, information we had that, information plays matter, information plays energy. So this is a sad thing, so it's a sacrifice. And in food, it's like this, Ducasse. So everything gets super uh, precious 
and uh, a little stead in a still life. So this is French sophistication in kitchen. So these are the three, there's no more. So these are the three different ways how we can make our point in an environment we don't know. How to get friend, how to, how to say something with things in a world we don't know. Good. Now try, I want to show you how to, what is this challenge with these, uh, with these, with these aliens? So if they landed, they are everywhere. Everything is all threatening. So we can make friends and so on. We, we, we start it. So I want to play the comedy with that. So what you see is uh, with my talk is a comedy. So <clears throat> the key problem is, and I would say it, you can't improve by doing better. This is what is, uh, is, uh, is introduced by these crazy aliens. So all these machines are just optimizing. They, they, they're getting better and better and so on. And you have to step out of that. So if you want to make architecture, don't try to solve a problem because problem solving is with design and with the machines. And the key sentence I think introduced by these uh, aliens is they never try to improve by doing better. So if you want to get friends, if you want to talk with these aliens, don't try to solve a problem. So and it's very important as well. So to realize that, that everything is much more complicated than everybody thinks in detail. So you have to affirm that. After all my research, it's very important. I always was afraid that somebody is coming and telling me, yeah, but uh, you know, and, you, and so you didn't understand well, whatever. Yeah, what are you telling there? And so on. It's like this and there. So nobody, nobody, somebody knows coming. It never happened. So and I'm pretty sure that nobody has a clue what to do with these aliens and what is going on. And the third thing to to to, uh, to affirm is nothing makes sense. And we see that with, uh, in, in, in our politics with, with Trump, it simply makes no sense. So if you try to make sense with what politicians, uh, for example, now Trump very prominently, what, what they are talking, it, it, it's, it, this is not how to talk with him. So these things are out of sense. And it's directly the same with, uh, with our computer screens. So look at the computer screens and the, all the colors, I can have any kind of, uh, of, of picture and so on, but you can touch it. There's no, the, and sensibility is about touching, for example. And you can touch it, it makes no sense. You can touch a, a piece of wood, you can touch uh, and smell a cheese, yeah, and, and uh, uh, taste a nice wine and, and so on. But a computer screen, it's nothing and everything. So all this makes no sense in the strict way that you can not touch it. It's not sensible. Yeah. So, or for example, this story that, uh, yeah, in principle with this internet, we are happy that we can get friends with, with Facebook and WeChat and so on. We can get friends with a lot of people. So then over three steps, we, can, we are friends with the whole world. So it's beautiful, I like it. But we are, uh, we are friends with all terrors, with all crime as well with all the beautiful things and with all the crime. So that's very, a very complicated setup. So which means 
yeah, what to do, how to distinguish between friends and enemies and so on, if you're connected with the world. So, and therefore I say, you can't improve by doing better. So if you get more connections, it's getting more dangerous to be a terrorist or to be, uh, to, yeah, because you're connected even in more details uh, to the whole world and all good and bad things. So, oh, for example, this is a poster in London at an art school on a prominent street. And they simply say the cells in your body contain genetic material, DNA. It's interesting that they have to tell that because in principle, everybody should know. And then they say, this carries the information that makes you, you. And I find that absurd, uh, completely absurd. So because why should it be the code, the literal code that is my person? So I had a life, a long life, experienced a lot of things, which is not my uh, DNA. I want to think in a certain way. I want to do something and so on. They simply say, this carries the information that makes you, you, which means whatever I'm doing doesn't matter because it's just my DNA. And they put it in this fancy setup and I couldn't believe that. Yeah, so if you go more and this kind of connectivity. And if you not try to give up that this makes any sense, you run in this problem that things are determined. You can't, you, you can't do anything. Yeah. Whatever we do, the world is available. The production, the trading, the, uh, the tourism looks at this. All this is somehow connected. We are very rich in all these cycles, all the repetitions and so on. All the access, all the money, all the power. And all this makes no meaning. <coughs> and in thermodynamics, we call that entropy. Yeah, we are facing the paradox that you can't improve by doing better. So the very architecture, for example, I like then, this is uh, uh, Archizum 1966. That is a kind of European version of what we had with uh, Steiny. <laughs> and, and they don't follow the machines. They just hang around and, and play in a, in a colorful and strong way, uh, 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 orthogonal to that. So they simply say, as architects, we are not all this, which is entropic. So it's fading out. Everything gets connected. It's fading out. Everything gets polite, empathic, and, uh, and, and stable. Nothing change. And they start to position themselves on this generic uh, uh, ground. So the rhetorics of, of these aliens. <clears throat> is that it's so easy. The problem of all these aliens is their power in pair with their accessibility. The nuclear, the drugs and the computing are the Mace, uh, and the Macy conferences and, and uh, contracting these aliens. So which, um, uh, uh, forget it. You can look it up with the Macy conferences. The interesting is after the war, they started to, uh, to organize the, the, world, uh, the, the world. It was not, they thought, they thought with the aliens, these are the three principal categories of aliens. And they um, uh, had a lot of advertisements to privatize uh, nuclear energy just to get, uh, get a free life independent of oil and so on. They uh, pretty soon um, uh, uh, stopped that and nuclear got military. They made a lot of experiments with drugs uh, uh, in, the, in, in the 60s. 
then that this got criminal and computing they put it uh, to the uh, to the public after after experiments in strong conflict with the uh, uh, with the attitude of uh, and the opinion of um, of the uh, of UK they were and the researchers had been advanced in UK to the US in that time and the UK said computing must be military it's dangerous but it set up that these alienating technology got military this alienating technology got criminal and this got uh, popular so and this works then that computing is not complicated it's getting simpler every day it's rhetoric of intuitive interfaces make us forget the complexity of things around make us lazy and thinking makes us follow the schemes of instant attraction and comfort. Not we are understanding computers, computers understanding us, these aliens. So this is what we, we have now here, the celebration of nonsense. So he, <laughs> there is a kind of uh, riot and he's making a selfie, a selfie himself with the background of the riot. Or she in Brazil, there's this whale and you make a back at the, at the beach, they make this kind of, um, uh, of of selfie with that. So it's 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 a celebration of these kind of nonsense we, we are doing, which is interesting in itself. So what to do then? And this is what we can learn from our Western, so as Western from our Western culture. The gnomon. <clears throat> and now we, we go, if we see all these phenomena, it's puzzling. If we have to affirm that there's no sense, how to make, to create meaning. So now we go a little abstract. Time to turn things, things around, to affirm the infinite horizon. Sacrifice the old order, being not all the noise, the noise we talked about. Take an upright position, stop moving, dead. Outraged towards the noise. Casting shadows of the order of the world in irrational circles. A statue, a gnomon, the one that knows. So on this is the stick, the gnomon, they put uh, to the moon. And the gnomon is GPS and clock in one. And it had been all the time. So you, with this with this stick, the, the ancient people had been able to get the time and the geoposition wherever they had been. And they put it in their pocket and put it and done. So they always uh, knew that. Now we think with our satellites and GPS, we are able to do that. They always have been able to do it. And it's just a stick. It's just more, it's more faster, more comfortable, smaller, what devices we have. But the thinking about time and space and organizing time in correlation, in proportion to space, uh, always is the same. This is not changing. And then the time I'm, I'm referring to is, uh, is uh, yeah, this is uh, Thales. This is a Greek philosopher, uh, a mathematician, some, I don't know, 500, 400, 500 BC, takes a shadow of the course of the Egyptian sun with the pyramids of the Egyptians to every location in space. So now in Renaissance, and this is the next abstraction to that. You see these axes here. And it's again about time, the rotations. Time is rotation of the sun here. And space is uh, here. We have space is the axis, the rotation of the planetary systems and Renaissance. This is from Kepler. Takes the shadow of the course of the Ptol uh, Ptolemaic uh, system to every vector in time. And I would say this is the Google metrics of probabilities. This is what we have today. Google, for example, takes a shadow of the analytic world to the every question 
uh, in life today. So and again, we have the axis of the world and rotation around that. So we have space and time. So I think it's this is a very strong line of, uh, of argument. This symmetry works in principle, but it does not work with the actual practice of Google establishing a simple gnomon for the whole world. So the problem now with, with Google is that they take this axis as the actual physical axis of our planet. What they did with Thales, what Kepler did, and how it was um, uh, 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 domesticated in our culture is that you simply can take this gnomon and put it everywhere and take it. So, and this is the current misunderstanding of, uh, of our, of IT. You can put the gnomon into your pocket. It is a source of you as a person. This is what we can uh, learn. Now, writing. If you lost all sense in entropic noise, if you are in outer space, beyond the horizons of time, you come back to the new world and you have to distill negentropic meaning anew. You are coming out of the universal and you have to negotiate using your intellect as a human. So which means you somehow affirm that there is no sense and now you're coming back as and like an alien and now you have to talk with the other aliens you have to learn to talk so and this is how we did it with Thales or Euclid here as we did it with the phonetic alphabet to contract nature in space we knew these kind of um, of uh, uh, diagrams A, B, C to make a, a, a triangle. It's very interesting that in China you have uh, a, a quite different uh, proof of, uh, of uh, this theorem. Uh, in the organization of the theorem and the proof of this theorem in space is, uh, is, is quite different. But what we did here what you can do is with these aliens. So you have characters, A, B, C. And by the way, they may, didn't make a drawing that time. They simply wrote it as phonetical uh, letters. So this is a very uh, important thing. So you have an A. So this can be anything. It's rotating like a planetary system. And you make an R. And now you have two like like stepping stepping wheels or, or so they, and, and they they do certain things and bam and now you have three and they uh, now you have art as an as an uh, as as something which appears from nothing just because you know how to do uh, these characters if you just say n t so then you have a, something else so it's just magic that you took it out of nothing and you have now this small animal or you have an abstract concept. So that's magic. And that's a magic of uh, 2,500 years ago invented then. To bring something uh, to space. Do the same in time with this perspective construction, what we mimic now with digital computing and graphics. So these, these are the drawings and it's a little complicated to read. What we have here is that we can draw, we can turn whatever we like and make it vivid in time. So it's, it's moving. This is with these drawings. So we do that, any artifact on a plane and make that uh, 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 movable in, in time. And uh, now what we do with code, I would say it's not space, it's not time. Now it's kind of life. So we have uh, these kind of processors, we have the lambda calculus, 
and we can simply can write, and again, it's writing whatever we like, plus three, five, and it's calculating to, uh, to eight. So and now it, it's again, it's a rotation. And we write vivid things. So they are vivid implicitly here. You show them here moving. And now the, they're turning and uh, the, um, the, uh, the writing get explicitly vivid. Or these kind of things, for example, x plus y equals five and x multiplied y equals six. And I want to solve that for x and y and simply do that and then Oh, what is this? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Then you see there are two solutions, x is two, y, and, and so on. You can turn whatever you like and it's making fancy things. So this is what coding is about. And code is the, the writing of today. These drawings are, had been the writings of the Renaissance and this phonetical writing had been the writing of uh, the ancient Greece and uh, Greek and uh, Roman uh, people. This was in space, writing in space. This I would say is writing in time and I would suggest Code is writing in life. So therefore in our uh, historicity, so I would suggest a kind of spiral of development over the centuries. So it's not a, it's not a line, it's time rotation, it, it's space and time. So you have the, the, the axis and you have the circularity both. And then you have symmetries and you have, a, have a, a, a oppositions and so on. And I would say development of our culture, technology and so on is in this spiral. We learn to write in space. We learn to read in space. We learn to draw in time. We learn to read in time. And now we learn to code in life in symmetry to drawing in time in symmetry to writing in space. So this is a kind of archaeology towards the masters, oops, of old times. So if we go, <coughs> if we try to do that, how, how to read that? These are the architecture of the three levels of the abstraction, space, time, and life, articulated in writing, drawing, and coding. So. Now we look for Thales. This is writing in space. This is the architecture of that. This is the geometry of drawing in time, Palladio, 15, uh, 16th century. And I would say this has to be, I don't know, but this has to be a geometry of coding in life. So I would say coding is not because it's not a phenomena what we have now since 2000 and so on. As I told you with the mathematics, it's 1880. All the paradigms of coding uh, has been uh, fully developed in 1930. The Lambda calculus I'm always working in and uh, all the programming languages on the von Neumann architectures they had been developed in 1930, fully developed. And what we experience now is just that it works everywhere, super cheap, super simple. But the principles are always there. Therefore, I would say we have to read architecture of the 20th century as aliens, as coded in life. So whatever it means. So therefore, this has been an alien in ancient Greek. And we had to learn to write in space to talk with them. These had been the aliens of the uh, 14th or 16th century, and we had to learn to draw in time to talk with them. And these are the aliens of the 20th, 21st century, and we have to learn to 
to talk with them by coding in live. So, therefore, being an alien, if you really want to do that and understand that as an architect in a new world, you need to be rich in reading. You need to be able to talk. A new, uh, a new needs for new talking, and it always comes with new readings and archaeology, digging in sediments to create meaning of a word once left, which means no sense. Like in, like in Renaissance Alberti and the measurements of Rome. In result, the new artifacts do not compete in space with the old artifacts. They translated them into time. So look at this. This is an old basilica, medieval basilica. And what Alberti in, uh, in Renaissance did, he just put it and gave this basilica a new face with a specific way of organizing the lines in space, which is drawing. This is the, the, the code as drawing or drawing in time and make that vivid uh, and that and make a start to talk uh, with these aliens. And it's not competing with the Basilica itself. So we can learn from that. This, I think, what we experience today. So we, we go to the cultural heritage today and we are transferring them into life in a digital archaeology. Therefore, we have all this cultural heritage all about the world. So we're just digging and trying to, uh, to, to get that and trans giving them a new face, which is uh, medialized. This is what we experience worldwide uh, today. Good. I think now we have exactly an hour. This would be great. I can continue for half an hour, 20 minutes, if you like. Or we stop here because it's just uh, the hour as promised. It's no problem if you want to continue. OK. <clears throat> OK, we had this uh, spiral to get some stability in these things. And now we looked in the vertical, in the spiral, uh, uh, going up, uh, down and up to learn things. Now we go to the uh, opposite side of the spiral to, to get uh, stability there and, and, and understanding. So remember the, this uh, stick here, the, the gnomon, the shadow. We call that in our culture an atom. It's a new element. It's an element in a new world, and uh, I call that uh, aliens. <clears throat> we have this kind of uh, schematic projection, and the key problem of that is, for example, the number of pi, so that you can't measure it. So it's out of um, out of calculability. So we, for example, we said. It's um, uh, <clears throat> now with computers. What can computer do and what can they can't? So what is so? For example, with, with our question, uh, can computer do architecture or not? Or, or is all problem solved? And here's a very simple answer from these old guys. <clears throat> for example, with the number pi. So this is a diagonal of uh, of uh, of. Uh, so this is a schematic, and then you have the the circle. So on the circle is not calculable, uh, calculatable. For example, the number pi. So you can have it with three with three digits. You can have it with three hundred digits, or you can have it with three thousand digits. And it's simply not ending, and there's no repetition, and you can't foresee. What is a 3001 character, but calculating it in a very complex way? This two, and now you don't know what is the next number. Look at it, and you have to calculate the whole thing to get the next number. There's no shortcut for that. <clears throat> so, 
So that's very important. So it's infinite. And infinite means it's really infinite, which means if you put these numbers and transfer it to, to, um, to characters to make it readable, then there's every poem, every talk ever said is part of this number. All the books are in letters are part of these numbers. You only have to find the position where it is. So the whole world is in an infinite number. So this is what the circle is. And because of that, you can't calculate that. So in the heliocentric way, world here, you are affirming infinity and you just make a decision. You simply say, and you symbolize it, for example, with pi or with square root of two, and you simply say, I don't, I can't calculate it, but I can work with it. I can make some predictions. I make a contracts. I can talk about it. This pi is a classical uh, uh, alien. So you can't, it's not real. It makes no sense because sense is what you can calculate with numbers and describe with numbers. Quite the opposite. So if you go with a spiral to the other side, you part of a knowing unit, part of nature, this is an axiom. And now you're projecting from, you're not within the circle. You're projecting from out the circle to a plane. So you're not going to the circle. You're going from out the circle to the line. And the problem there is the prime numbers. And we have the same problem here. The only thing what is working with numbers, and numbers are the only thing we can make systems of, the most only thing which uh, we can uh, uh, make order and uh, organize things and make it uh, right, they are the most un organized uh, uh, species ever. So you see the, the, the difference between the, 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 uh, the next number here, it's simply not predictable again, but by calculation. These are all the prime numbers and you know they are very unorganized. So there's no system in it. So therefore the only thing you can make a system of is the most unsystematic ever. So we call this world geocentric instead of, instead of heliocentric. This is an atom, this is an axiomatic. So, and in the ge geocentric, you affirm the paradox to make the right step towards infinity, yeah? And the, so therefore you have the, the opposition of infinity. Yeah, in, in the geocentric world, you affirm the paradox. Yeah, and in the heliocentric, you affirm the infinity. In the geocentric, it's about talking. In the heliocentric, it's about reading. So, and we are in, uh, in, in very good company. For example, we have with Kurt Gödel, complete and consistent. An axiomatic system is either complete and correct or correct and incomplete. Or in quantum physics, we have particles and wave. Elements are neither particles nor wave. So, and Information is neither matter nor energy as we had it with, uh, with uh, uh, Norbert Wiener. So it's not super strange because with Pythagoras, the irrational hypotenuse or the number pi or the square root and so on, this is what they developed two and a half thousand years ago, is neither odd nor even. It's an irrational number, like I explained with the number of pi. So they had the same phenomena like, phenomena like we had with matter and energy, 
or we had with the uh, complete and consistency, completeness and consistency, what we are struggling with machine intelligence today. It's just the same problem with even and odd numbers, or with the paradox and the infinity, or with the human intellect and uh, intelligent humans. So we agree with Norbert Wiener, information is not matter nor ener or energy, but we disagree with the cybernetic cyclic shortcut that information is information. <clears throat> if you make this distinction between, I want to give you with talking and reading. Now I'm looking for examples. For example, in painting, Caravaggio, I would say, this is writing and talking. So this is a talkative picture. In strong contrast to Manet, 19th century, 16th century, 19th century, just the inversion. And this picture is not talking, it's uh, uh, reading, it's listening. Do the same with sculptures. Michelangelo, 16th century, talking, listening, reading, Rodin, 19th century. These are the inversions, directly, in, out, out, in, circular, linear. This corresponds to the primes, this corresponds to, to these uh, distinctions and to the primes and the irrational numbers. Talking, reading. Get that. <clears throat> this is an image of the entropic noise in space. So this is, if everything is connected, so uh, this is what we, what we are driving uh, to with, with, our, with the internet, everything is connected, everything is polite, there's uh, nothing exciting, just white noise. These are points in time. We know as a Cartesian, uh, as a Cartesian uh, coordinates, they are not all the other points in space. The differential calculus, are rational uh, movements in time, thinking in terms of space, they are irrational because they are beyond the entropic horizon. So if you affirm that, if you're coming back as aliens, they are irrational, so this is real, makes no sense. If you're coming back as, as, as an alien, so they get irrational, they, they are beyond this horizon. So they know all these things and they're coming back like this uh, gnomon, in this case, like Kepler's gnomon. And they're beyond reason, they are, they are in outer space, they are in time. So, and now this is a Cartesian system. So you have a firm that reality is like that. It makes no sense anymore then you start with a new kind of rationality and you can move freely between spaces in time. This is what we had in uh, Renaissance. This is a Kepler machine. This is the energy of the point in time. Cold is encapsulated energy of time bypassing the nature of space. This is the energy they had. This is a corresponding articulation in architecture. We, sh uh, we should read these drawings as rational in time and irrational in space. These are the, the architecture of that. The inside of this architecture is a picture of all the world in space. So the old world, this building is connected. So this is all the world, the old world. This is irrational, that's the lost old world here, but this picture is circular, it's irrational, 
the center of this building knows everything, but it's not all of this. It is not in space, it is in time. So it's like this. So it's not any longer reality. You rationalize that and you're moving in time with an abstract notion of space. So this is how it is articulated in architecture. Being connected to everything in space, this building has a singular position in time. It's cultural, it's directive, it's rational, and it talks in time. So this is how is talking in time. And these are the dreams of the last world of, of space. This is how architecture works in this environment. The old world as memories and the new talk in a new world with the aliens. Now do the same with our, with our world. Now we want to make a symmetrical step to talk about architecture in the 20th century. This is an entropic noise in time. These are the, <clears throat> the houses of the city center in Zurich. So these are all the parameters of the of this houses in Zurich. They're all friends. They're all connected in an entropic way. So it makes no sense. Everybody is, is happy and, 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 and working and so on. These are all the houses. This is Zurich. We now use a technique of machine learning to referring to Markov, 1906. This is uh, the Google precessor to create a probability space in life. This is how we made it. This is a matrix of, met, uh, of Markov. These are the points in life and then not all the other points in space. The differential probability of calculus are, uh, are rational movements in life. Now it's symmetrical to the other. And you see now it, it's a machine to, to get an understanding of how it might work, how to read uh, architecture and how to use uh, artificial intelligence and big data to, to how to read it that uh, it's get a new stability in this alienated work. And it's very mechanic. So I'm just taking the same words as I did, uh, did before. And uh, it's not a sentence um, uh, which is working by itself. It just works with uh, the sentence here in symmetry. The differential probability calculus are rational movements in life, thinking in terms of time. They are irrational because they are beyond the entropic horizon. And by that beyond reason, they are in outer space, they are in life. So now I can move between buildings, not between points. So whatever it means. And this is what we're doing with AI. This is what uh, people did with Descartes with the differential calculus. So it's moving between spaces. And here we are moving between times. So therefore I'm pretty sure that machine intelligence is, a, it's, is just a very simple thing. It's very generic and it's a very, it, it's, in principle, and we know that it's always the same principle algorithm. There's a huge diversity. It's just uh, engineering and optimization to make it a little faster and so on for certain problems. But the very principle is all the same. And uh, it's, it's very few uh, code. And it's working like this. Therefore, I think machine intelligence is something like the differential calculus. So, and you are not moving between spaces, you're moving between times, whatever it means with machine intelligence. And this is the energy of the points in life. Photovoltaic is encapsulating, instead of the coal, photovoltaic is encapsulating energy of life, bypassing the nature of time. So we have all the streams of energy from the sun, solar energy circulating, we have the weather, and this is our planet. And this is how we can get it. So we, we code mat, uh, matter with phosphorus and boros, and that's it. We dope matter. If then is, uh, 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 a photon is coming, 
these extras here, they jump here and uh, fill uh, these, try to fill these gaps, but this is not working. And then they move back and so on. So it's an unhappy state. In a certain symmetry, there's a kind of coding of on an on a atomic, atomic level. And this is photovoltaic to transfer uh, the energy of a photon towards an electron. And this is a corresponding articulation in architecture. We should read these drawings as rational in life and irrational in time. So this is with Corbusier, these kind of uh, measurements. The inside of this architecture is a picture of all the world in time. This building is connected, but this picture is circular. It's uh, irrational. The center of this building knows everything, but it is not at all this. It is not in time, it is in life. This is uh, Picasso. By being connected to everything in time, this building has a singular position in life. It is sculptural, it's directive, it's rational. It talks in life. So I think this is the principal mechanics of the ar digital architectonics. So it can't be uh, defined, it can't be a machine. It's a, a comedian uh, set up as I, uh, to, to create a new uh, understanding of architecture, what architecture might be, affirming that uh, uh, artificial intelligence, big data is constitute, constituting uh, our new global world. So this had been a Western kind of story around these topics. Thank you very much. That was my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hovestad. Today, Professor gave us a, a very exciting presentation, a, a novel combination of history mathematics, poetry, and theory. I think he's uh, providing us deep insights into two questions. First, what is computing and what is architecture? Then uh, we can, we might be have a new perspective on architectonics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Professor Hofstadt gave us some uh, references. Uh, the first reference is, I think, the history. I think for for Chinese audience, I think we are less familiar with these uh, lines of history. For example, I think according to uh, Hofstadt, I, I think the compute the history of computing is uh, much earlier than than the invention of digital compute. I think in, uh, in my personal experience, the, the computing is started with around 2000, because at that time we know that there is a thing called a computer. I think for a European, I think this, the history of computing is started with, start around the middle of 20th century. But if we look into the, what is computing, actually the, the foundation or the theory of computing is, uh, uh, safely, it's. Uh, I think it's not not later than twentieth century, and uh, Hofstadt even look uh, close into a uh, Renaissance to see how uh, how the Renaissance uh, pioneers what uh, there is a. Uh, mm, there is analog between these Renaissance thinkers and uh, nowadays thinkers based on big data and machine intelligence. This is, uh, I think, the, the first reference. I think the second reference is computer science itself. Uh, since Professor Hofstad has both a degree on architecture and, and computer science, I think there, there is a uh, a problem today, today there is a problem. Many keywords in computer science, uh, we have uh, mis 
understanding its uh, uh, its meaning and its uh, uh, background. For example, the shape grammar, uh, the the wider audience think the shape grammar is uh, start with start in nineteen seventies and start with computer, but actually it's uh, uh, it's based on uh, is Hilbert's curve, and actually, it's uh, uh, already based on the, the topological theory. And also, uh, today we can uh, see a lot of research and papers, like related to uh, generative design, parametric design, and and nowadays, uh, big data and machine intelligence. I think uh, in order to understand them correctly, I think uh, uh, Hofstadt suggests us we have to uh, first to see what, what, what they are based on and what, what these codes are really doing. And I, I think uh, um, we, we need uh, many references and readings and uh, a lot of coding to gradually to see what, what, what are the, the uh, real logic behind these algorithms. And this is a second reference. And the third reference, I think it's uh, coding itself. Uh, maybe uh, later uh, professor can explain what, what are the, uh, the software you, you, you do in the presentation. I think it's a Mathematica. Uh, uh, I think uh, the team in Professor Hovestadt, uh, they, they have tried many programming tools. For example, uh, start with uh, fresh action script, Java, now Python and Mathematica. I think it's uh, coding and doing it is also a very important measure to understanding these alien new things. Now, I, I think we can uh, give some time uh, to the audience to have questions. Uh, we can uh, type questions uh, in, in the chat window. So uh, professor can read it and answer it. Oh, maybe you can speak it again in Chinese to most of the audience because of them come from China. Well, uh, Mahovish他的教授在演讲的一开始介绍了在两千年之前，呃，两千年到两千一零年之前，他做了很多。数字技术的应用就是包括跟佐格德梅隆合作北京的鸟巢这部分很具体的工作就是具体的做这种数字化设计走向实践其实他们在一零年之前就已经做了很多尝试并且有出了一本书那么从一零年开始呢他就转入研
所谓的算法，像呃形式语法、参数化设计以及现在的大数据，那么我我们接收到的信息可能是比较零碎的片段的介绍，呃，那么。呃 ，Hof s t a d e 教授他本身是计算机系、计算机专业出身的，所以他本身对这些算法他本身的内部的逻辑非常清楚。那么，但是他做的事情是更进一步，他要去呃反思这些算法它背后的思维方式，从更远的历史，就从文艺复兴到十九世纪这一段时间，他想从那一段历史里面，从那一段的文学啊。呃，艺术家还有建筑师里面去找到，呃，这些算法它所，呃，对应的一个思维方式。那么第三个着眼点就是编程本身。那么这一点在他的演讲里面本身并没有太多的体现。其实他的团团队是非常硬核的技术派，就是每个人的很多日常工作都是在进行用。呃，像 Python 啊、Mathematica 进行具体的编程工作，就是通过编码的方式来实践自己的呃理论跟想法。呃，那么他们团队就是早期呃用 Java 比较多，那么现在呃为了应对像嗯、呃、大数据啊、机器学习这些新技术，他们现在更多的用 Python 跟 Mathematica。好，我我想呃呃。这个可能也是我个人的看法。那么大家听听了他的演讲，有什么问题可以呃呃，可以直接语音或者是打在这个对话框里面都可以One question. Okay, with with the construction. <laughs> no, I think um, so. From our from our perspective, <clears throat> what we uh, from Western perspective, what we experience with with computers and with these upcoming, what I say with uh, with these aliens is that we have to leave our. Old world, because the aliens somehow take over, and we don't know how they are doing it. So, in the, uh, uh, deconstructivism is, uh, in in this metaphor, and、uh, is is a kind of being sad or celebrating that we the old world is not working any longer. So that、uh, <clears throat> you simply you you take these new tools of the of the aliens. And you're playing around with them, and you're a little sad that the old world is not working any longer. Any longer, but then you get exhausted by de deconstructing the old world with the new tools. So, which is、um, simply makes、uh, no sense. So it makes it the the old world even faster in vanishing. So this might be the the point that we affirm the entropic uh, dissolution, uh, dis uh, dissolvement of the. Of the、uh, of this old world, so and therefore I, yeah, I don't not I do not sympathize with with that because it's it's not using these new tools in a in a in an, in an adequate in a positive way. It's just being sad that things changed. So future of architecture would be to, in, in my understanding, would be affirm that、uh, our world got alienated, and、uh, just learn to do it. And it, it's a rebirth of of architecture, as it had been. Therefore, this strong reference to the Greek architecture and then the Renaissance architecture. There had been aliens as well with these new technologies in phonetic writing or in in these、uh, in these、uh, perspective drawings. These had been aliens. They had been super powerful. Everything changed, and this always had been the birth of a new architecture. Therefore, we call that Renaissance, which is a rebirth of uh, of uh, of, the, of the world. So I think we、uh, architecture. Needs to get out of、uh, of this 
uh, of, of this gen generic stuff. So we have to affirm that uh, you can't improve by doing better. We have to affirm <laughs> that a machine is with a design, is with optimization. This, so, and this is not how aliens work. So how our world uh, is constituted. This is just with the machines. So this is just done. You can get it for granted. So an architecture is then doing something which makes, uh, which, which has meaning. So start to, to talk and to learn to talk with this uh, alienated uh, world. So this has to be uh, uh, developed. So it's exactly so to affirm that machines do design. Then what to do? This will be architecture about not celebrating that machines doing better. So this is destructive, the, the deconstructions. This would be my, my answer to that. So human computer interaction uh, is a question of design. So I, I'm, I'm strictly uh, uh, against that. It's good that machines work. And if I push bottom A, function A works. So all this is good, but it's uh, not interesting. I think with code, uh, as you see, because everything, each character, if I, like this example is art, a R T and then you have this word. So everything is connected with everything and language and writing is exactly not an interface. So because you can combine anything and uh, you're doing it, uh, that's prior to any interface. So uh, <clears throat> uh, this, uh, so with human computer interaction, I find it very, uh, very annoying that uh, some designers think I should follow these things. So this is the strategy how aliens make me uh, a follower. So this I would say is uh, human computer interaction. I'm, uh, I'm really annoyed by that. So uh, disorder and order is um, this. Yeah, you can say, I would say, well, this is very, very, uh, it's getting uh, uh, mathematical and, and philosophical. Yes, I think we have to affirm this order, but I would say this is uh, entropy so that everything is in, entropy means everything is in order. So, and this is interesting with um, mathematically with, with white noise is, this is total order. It's just affirming that everything is in, in bed. So there's nothing spectacular anymore. This is uh, order, this is white noise. Therefore, with entropy, with the, with the uh, um, um, uh, phys physical uh, concept of entropy or with the corresponding mathematical concept, um, um, their uh, order and disorder collapse in entropy. Therefore, I, I would uh, like uh, to use uh, entropy and what you call order, I would say yes, uh, but I would name it, uh, and then it's negentropy, I would say it's, uh, it's a constitution. So we have to constitute, uh, for example, uh, the stability of a triangle, or we have to constitute the probability matrix of a certain data set and so on. And this is, it's working and it's stable because we know and we are able to talk about it and we are able to do it. So we are able to play and to talk with aliens and make that stable. So, but I would say this is a constitution. It's not order. So because order and disorder uh, uh, collapse uh, in the entropic uh, uh, infinite. So, but I think what you're meaning is, yes, I'm fighting disorder and I'm pro order and therefore I'm against the construction. But I would take other terms. Oh, that's a complicated question.
I, I can't get this question. That's a long question. Having a construction tools and so on. I, I don't get the question. Sorry. By uh, Janice Morales. <laughs> Yeah, this is um, with the city and the tools. Um, I would say, uh, if you go with protocols, I'm fine. I think you're with urbanism and infrastructures and these urbanism and infrastructure simply should work. So uh, there, uh, so I, I want to have water clean. I want to have hospitals. I want to have schools. I want to have electricity working. I want to have my mobile phones working. These needs protocols and this needs codes to run a city. And I would say this is urbanism. And I like urbanism because it has to work. Otherwise, uh, we are struggling. So uh, this is with, with the machines, this is with design, with optimization and so on. And this should work and otherwise uh, uh, we are in trouble. The city is different <coughs> in strong contrast to the discourses because everybody thinks it is a city if there are just a lot of people in, 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 a, in, a, in an agglomeration. I think a city needs architecture. So, and it needs a ground, an urban uh, environment, which is uh, uh, working, but um, a city uh, needs uh, architecture. And I would uh, make and, and say code is with architecture, protocols are with, um, uh, with, uh, with the uh, uh, urbanization. So I think that it's good that protocols organize cities and this has to be improved and it should work worldwide. It's a scandal if people uh, somewhere in Africa don't get penicillin and, and or not clean water. This should not be like that. So, but the city is with code and not with protocols. And the code is talking with the aliens. The urbanism, not. Professor, I have a simple question. Like, could you give exa some good examples the digital technology applied to architecture? <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, this is what I... I um... So this is always what you're, what, what you're thinking. So that... And, and uh, it took me a long time not to ask this question. <laughs> 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 because I, I, I strongly believe that um, if you follow my, my, my talk, that uh, it should be not radically new with the digital. So what I'm, I'm a little struggling with is what we're discussing is that people, uh, computer people think in, that uh, there should be something radically new with computers in architecture. So therefore they always make a kind of marketing for the technology. I don't think this is proper, a proper setup. My uh, uh, understanding of what computing is with its origin in the mathematics from 1988, I would say digital architecture started around 1900. So therefore I would like to read all 20th century architecture as digital. So my favorite building, so that's very, yeah, because I don't think digital started in 2000 with some genetic, uh, generic algorithms. This is a marketing in a certain detail. Therefore, I would say prominent architecture and masterpieces architecture 20, 21 century is what I'm, uh, what uh, examples I would give. So my, my, my favorites, contemporary favorite is, uh, is, uh, is, is Kulhas. I think the the master of all is uh, Corbusier in digital architectonics. This is what I would say.
Yeah, for so me, it's skip this idea that uh, with a digital, it has to be then with robots or with, with these and that, or with, with fancy forms and so, or, or colors or materials. I would skip all this because they made all these kind of principal experiments without robots, uh, if you look at the beginning of 20th century. Everything is there because the thinking was there. And now it gets available and so everybody makes something with it. So it's getting very popular. But the things are there. And what we have now with all this popularity, it's very complicated to find uh, the masterpieces. So and with the principal thinking, digital architecture, we would call it today like that, started around 1900. And then look for masterpieces in the 20th, 21st century. Then you are there. <clears throat> And therefore, I showed you in, at the beginning with Archizoom, with Fritz Haller, with uh, Buckminster Fuller, and so on. These are my, my, my masters, my personal preferences. So this is how I grew up. These are my masters of uh, digital architecture. This is how I, I'm socialized. Yeah, you gave me strong motivation to reread this architectural history. <laughs> And it's quite different. If you read them uh, uh, with this perspective, the interesting phenomena is that um, <clears throat> uh, uh, if you read an architectural tri treatise or tractatus or manifest, whatever it is from 1900, 1920, 19, so then they all know these things. They directly talk about these things I'm talking about quite different from what happened, uh, uh, as I told you, with, with the cat system or with the food around 1980, something uh, uh, stopped. So nobody is really talking anymore about any substantial thing. Everything gets super disciplinary and everybody is hiding and, and, and nobody knows any longer. Things 85, very interesting. And if you, if you read the text about uh, the theory about from architects about, about architecture, it's very complicated to find something reflecting these things uh, in, in the last 30 years, very complicated. And it's super easy to find 100 years earlier. Thank you very much. I think we can still have one or more questions. Uh, there's another one. No. Oh. <laughs> no. Good. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much again for today's lecture and for organizing this series of talks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Tomorrow. A nice opportunity to speak <laughs> to all your audience. <laughs> Thanks a lot and see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow we will have uh, uh, Fabio, Professor Fabio Gramazio talk at the same time, uh, four o'clock Beijing time. Thank you, bye.